So I, I, I'm a believer in in the modern equipment, and I, I brought my very first camera that I ever owned. I paid seven dollars for it, a German rangefinder. Uh, came from a Navy guy yeah, trying to get home at the, at the bus depot. Needed seven bucks for a ticket. So anyway, I bought that and I learned how to use it. And I even stuck the very first picture when I took with that camera in 19, it was August 1965. So not that that's important, but I just thought I'd show you that I do. I have upgraded since then, but um, I had a friend of mine, I worked, I built um, crazy stuff for the military, my first job, and he was going to go over to Vietnam and do some training on some equipment we built. And I said, bring me back an icon, because I'd used an icon in college. And I kind of, he said, okay. And I thought, well, I'll pay you when you get back. And he said, all right. And he came back two weeks later or three weeks later and said, where I was, no stores, no nothing. He said, I had a Paid an airman to go to go into their VX and buy me something. He said, "Okay, what'd you buy me?" He hand me this box, twenty-eight millimeter lens, <laughs> and it's not Nikon; it was Canon. I said, oh, "Okay." <laughs> so I, I went to the camera store and said, "Buy me something. I need a camera body that fits this lens." So he sold me that thing, and that's what I got here. And that's the original lens that came from Vietnam. It cost me. $35. So I had a $35 wide angle lens, 28 millimeters, what I started life with. I only had one lens, um, one camera, one lens. I had, had to learn how to use everything with 28 millimeters. So I became kind of a wide angle guy for about six months until I could afford a, a second lens. Second lens I bought, uh, let me tell you about the first good shot I took. This is in the Great Sand Dunes. And my wife we were out there hiking, and I took this picture of her, and it got people won all kinds of awards. Uh, uh, Kodak International, something I don't remember. Kenzo Awards, anyway, nationwide. So it was kind of cool. That was the first first uh, good shot I took with that camera, with that lens combination. So my weight around like an afforded two hundred. So I had a two hundred to the twenty eight. That's the only two lenses I had for about eighteen months. And it was really kind of cool because it told me I was one thing. I'm an extremist. All I like either long telephoto or wide wide angle. And the stuff in the middle is okay if you shoot video or something. But for, for what I like to do, I like the extremes because it gives you a chance to play around with, with um, perspective control. And, and I stuck with the extreme ends for a long time. I, I ended up, I bought, did buy a Canon F1 from Tokyo, and it had a 50 millimeter one four lens. So at some point, I did get a few lenses in the middle. Back then, zooms were horrible. They were, I mean, not. They made good door stops. That's the one they were good for. They weren't very sharp. So I had, I had, a, I had a 20, 24, 28, 35, 50, 85, 100, 135, 200, 300, 400, and eventually uh, 600. And uh, the thing I was married because my wife cared it all for me. I didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I'm going to show you. There's a couple of things about people don't like about wide angle lenses. And, and one of them is they say they distort really bad. Well, I've got a, if you have three tennis balls and you're going to photograph them, you've got your 50 millimeter lens, and the point of that lens is pretty pretty far up in the lens. So you get pretty straight lines coming back to the to the uh, sensor plane, which is right here. Same with a with 100 millimeter. Same three tennis balls. They're, they're projected pretty straight onto there. And if you look at, I'll show you the nodal points uh, where they would be. That's where the, the light rays cross over. If you look at the 16 millimeter, it's it's really near the back, especially now with mirrorless. The, the designers are able to, to have the point cross way back here at the back of the lens. So the first, uh, first the middle tennis ball gets projected straight through there. And guess what? It looks pretty cool. The other two are projected at pretty oblique angles. So when that happens, they get elongated. It's called projection distortion. So that's what you see, and I'll show you some examples of that. And I do, where that's over there. Um, just so you fully understand this, I did bring a flashlight that I can show you. And if, I, if I'm here, that's okay. If I'm over, you know, if it's a hundred millimeters, those gonna be about the same or a fifty. 
If I write a 16 millimeter, I'm going to be here. Let me just open it up. It's here. And then it goes over there. Look what it does. That's that projection distortion I'm talking about. And it's worse on the corners than it is on the two edges. So that's uh, one of the things that people object to. And I, um, I've got some samples of that, what they look like, like this poor girl's head. <laughs> it looks like extremely deformed, but that's with a really wide angle lens. Uh, my friend Mario down in Peru, uh, his head looks a little long. It always looks a little long to me, so maybe it's not so bad. But, uh, you know Mario. Anybody know Mario right beside me? Okay. Um, and then I, I did these dancers in Peru, high school students, doing a show for us before we went to photograph the, the, um, you know, the yeah. birds, the big birds, yeah. condors. So, uh, so, you know, that's not too bad, but this girl, oops, wandered over the edge. And you see what it did to her skirt in that corner, just blew it out like, like there's a gust of wind. She's the only one to have the gust of wind. And then here's a shot of my wife standing at, next to one of the fig trees. And she looks like she's about seven feet tall and five feet of its legs. And I know better than that. What yeah. focal a, length was that, Jim? What's that? What focal length was that? Um, 16. I don't know, it could have been 16, it could have been uh, 14. I, I've got a couple of different lenses. But. Okay, let's just say, and the, and unfortunately, they're no longer with us in the twin trade towers. You want to get a picture of one of them. So you go halfway up in, in one, and you get your 50 millimeter, and you look straight across, and you take a shot. You say, wow, I can't get the whole thing in, but there's there's a shot, and I didn't draw a bunch of windows. I said, etc. for windows. But anyway, it's just, you know, but you can't see the whole thing. You say, well, you know, I just, I got buddies at, at um, camera store, and they sold me this really cool wide, wide angle lens. I'll put it on. I go to the same spot. I shoot the full thing. I get the whole thing in one shot. And I look at it, and it's distorted. It's all goofy looking, you know. I said, well, I, I can't use that because it's it's not right. So I get my 50 out and I go back up to the same spot again. And I shoot one straight across and I shoot one up and I shoot one down. I got three shots. The one straight across is square. The one looking up like that. The one looking down looks like that. I'll put them together. It looks like that. Hmm. What's the difference? Which one is distorted, right? And the, the, the problem is that, that with that super wide angle lens, I'm standing right here and I'm getting all of this. And then when I make the print, I put it over here and I'm looking at it from way over here and it looks goofy. Anytime you've got a wide angle lens and your, your super wide angle lens and it looks distorted to you, the thing I say to do is find the middle of that thing and, and I'll just show you walk up, stick your nose in it. <laughs> Look up and down, it looks normal, okay? Mm -hmm. Because you're seeing it from so far away. If you get a close look, you have to raise your head and lower your head so it looks normal to you. It's not really distortion. It's um, it is a sort of a distortion, but it's because the film plane is now tilted relative to the subject. So, um, so that's you know, there's there's a way around this. I've got some. This is uh, the Opera House and my first and I'm going and it was tilted a little bit, but I squared it up with. The software to keep it from being so keystone. Same here with the uh, Cottonwood Falls courthouse. Uh, and I always like to shoot it from, from the side so you see it's not a, a movie set flat. You know, you shoot it down Main Street, it looks like it could be a cardboard cutout at the end of the street. So I like to show the shape of it and then the sun going down and kind of helps. Uh, here's, a, here's one I didn't do any work to yet. It's a church. And on the islands, uh, the Outer Hebrides in Scotland. So I did run the automatic software through it. it looks rather goofy, doesn't it? <laughs> so, yeah. so at some point, you just say, ah, it's just going to look like that. Or the other option is find buildings that look like that. You know, <laughs> certain pointed buildings, you know, like the Air Force Academy. That looks, that's not distorted at all. It's perfect. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's really good for finding something that's got that point to it. Even the inside of the chapel is good. <laughs> Okay, I want to control perspective. I talk about using perspective to control shots. Uh, I'm just going to show you something. I zoom with the lens and I'll use my feet to readjust. Okay, so I've got this 
maybe he used to be our receptionist where I used to work in Mac. And she always created her model for me, and I'll give you, I'll shoot your portrait for you. She said, okay. So anyway, I, I get up here with a 17 millimeter lens, I'm barely close. I see how tall she is in the viewfinder. I make a you know, kind of a mental note of where that is. But 17 millimeter. Now I'm going to go back up and zoom into 24, keep her the same size, go back up again, zoom into 30. Back up again, zoom into 35, back up again, zoom into 50, back up again, zoom into 75, back up again, zoom into 105, 135, 200. Now she's the same size in every picture, but look at the background. The background's totally changed. So I'm I'm controlling the perspective, the relationship between her and the background by doing two things. I'm changing focal length and I'm changing my position. So I'm keeping her the same size, but I'm adjusting how she looks relative to the background. And I'll back up through these really quick so you can see what's the trees. Right. Too far. So you get the idea. That now I've now got some control of the perspective I want to show you. So that's what I'm doing with this adjusting position and, and focal length. I have to get back through it again. Um, so why would I want to control it? Well, there's a rancher, let's just say it's a rancher in Western Kansas. They said, they wanted to put, trying to talk me into putting these wind turbines in. I don't want to do it. You know, I need, can you take me a picture? It makes them look huge and too big. I said, yeah, I know a place that's got a little windmill and I'll put the wind turbines in with that. So I go out, I take a picture of that little windmill next to the wind turbine with a 200 millimeter lens. I brought a ways away. And you say, oh man, those wind turbines are huge, aren't they? Two weeks later, wind turbine com company calls and says, can you get a picture that shows that our wind turbines aren't that big compared to a windmill? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can do that for you know, a fee of like 500 bucks. Okay, do it. So I go back out and I shoot it with a 28 millimeter lens closer up to the little windmill. But uh, okay, no, it's bad. <laughs> so, Photographers don't lie, cameras don't lie, but we can stress the truth a little bit here and there. <laughs> so that's why I want to be able to control perspective. There was a movie called Jaws. You might see it. There was one scene where he's sitting on the beach and a shark is a, and the kids are yelling and screaming every time he jumps, and it's a false alarm every time. And finally, when it really happens, it's like this can't be happening. And so there's a, an effect called a zoom dolly, and that's where they zoom and dolly at the same time. It's a no-no in motion pictures because it gives the audience a feeling that this can't be real. So I'm going to show you what it looks like. So they're, they're dolly, they got the camera on a dolly, and they're rolling it in closer to him, and they're zooming it out at the same time. So look at the background. And that, that's, your whole brain can't function with that. That's called a zoom dolly. And again, that's controlling perspective to give you a feeling that this can't be real. Okay. Seen it enough times? Okay. Yeah. All right, so I'm out at, I'm out at uh, in Western Kansas at, at Monument Rocks, and that's me over there. My wife's taking pictures, and I just happened to notice these little orange flowers down there, and, and I thought that'd be kind of cool with the, with the rocks in the background. There are not many of them. So I'll go over and lay down, and I'm taking a shot there, and, and I've got about, if you look at those little flowers, there's only about two feet of them, right? And so there's 60 or 70 feet over to the formations. I've got a super wide angle lens. I'm down on the ground. I'm, I mean, I've got dug a hole for my chin so I can see through the viewfinder. Actually, I go into live view, so it's a little easier. But anyway, I'm looking at these flowers, and there's the shot I was taking. Those flowers look like they go... 30, 40 feet, halfway or more over to the rock formations. So I'm controlling the relationship of the flowers to the background. I'm doing that super wide angle lens. Those two flowers, there's always a button right there. Those two flowers are about an inch from my front element to my lens. I mean, they're close. And so why would you shoot a shot like that? Well, if you can sell it to travel Kansas for some money, you do that, right? In the old days, in the 80s, 80s and 90s before digital, a shot like that was a cover shot in a regional magazine worth about 
or national magazine is with 800 to 1200, depending on the magazine. I got 75. Okay, it's better than nothing. All right, I'll just show you this is a shot I took last week in Wyoming. And I'm, I'm, this, this, there's a couple of flowers there. There's one here and there's one right behind it. And, and I'm just going to show you how close my front element is. I went around with the iPhone and took this shot. So you can see how close the, the, the flowers are to the front element. You look at the photo, you know, the flowers aren't gigantic. They're, I mean, they're, they're bigger than life size on the screen, but, you know, it's, but I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating this perspective because I want it, I want it to look the way I want it to look, regardless of what it really looks like. Um, my goal is to make it look the way I want it to look. Here's another example. Now, you notice all these I've been down low. Now I'm up high, you know, six feet. I'm walking around taking pictures on the Oregon coast to see these footprints. Well, those are cool. So um, maybe I get down low. So I try getting down right down the ground. You got a little projection distortion going on here, make that heel longer and kind of cool. I like that. Uh, and this is a really good shot. But, you know, it's got those other steps over there. So I got a, a, a basically, I got a digital limb with some leaves on it. It's called a, it's called um, Lightroom. I got a little thing I can get rid of this. So, so I get rid of those feet over there. It looks a lot better. It's just the one set going out there and not coming back. I yeah, see so he's halfway to Hawaii, but now swimming. <laughs> so I, I, I've become very partial to wide angle lenses. There's also times when you need to get, and this is what everybody buys it for, to get more stuff in your picture. This is a, a McDonald's Observatory in West Texas, and I wanted to give a shot of the of the um, old telescope inside the dome, and, and it's kind of nice that I can get in there. He's a pretty wide angle lens. I was probably shot with 24 or 17 or something in that range. There's also, uh, this is inside a, a Maasai. Uh, this is a chief. It's inside his house in uh, Tanzania. He invited us in, so we came in and we're all kind of sitting on the ground. And I got, got my really wide lens and shot a picture of the interior. He and his wife and his daughter there. Here's one in the the cot in the in the fuselage in the passenger compartment of the um, Ford Tri Motor 1928. Kind of cool, you know. Wide angle lens, you can see the whole inside and all the pictures and how nice it looks. You can also see the whole cockpit and all the instruments. How many people know what a Ford Tri Motor is? There's a just for your own knowledge, there's a motor in the front and the middle, and there's one out on each wing, under each wing. And those pylons that hold those motors out on the wings, that's where all the instruments are for those motors. So when you're flying it, you want to see what the, you got to put, get binoculars and read the, what are RPM they're doing because just, they're out there. They, didn't, they don't have them inside. So those two engines run separately. I just know that because I. I flew co-pilot in it. This is coming to land at, at Salina, hmm. that 28 four time motor. Okay, let's talk about something else you do with a wide angle lens. Shutter speed and, and wide angle kind of go hand in hand in certain situations. The direction of motion, if something's coming towards me, it's, it doesn't blur very easily. Something going across this way blurs very easily. So I, I had my wife drive the old Mercury we had around in circles, and I took pictures, 500th of a second. She's only going about 15, 20 miles an hour. 30th of a second, 8th of a second. There's a little blur there, but very little, right? So then I moved over and said, now you drive by me and do the same thing. And I shot same way, 500th of a second. 30th of a second, it's got noticeable blur, right? Eighth of a second, the thing's almost disappeared. I mean, it's just it's just a huge blur. But once you know this, then there's a chance that you could set your camera up, your wide angle lens on it, in a canoe, in a car, in a train, if you if you have access to the front of the train, right on the cow catcher or something. And and you're going that direction, 
And so you got, it makes it look like things are coming towards you, and they're also going by you on the sides. There's a place in the upper state New York called Oswald Chasm, 1977. I just messing around, shot this with a 20 millimeter lens, going through that chasm. Low shutter speed, I got the blurs on the side. Kind of cool. That's a wide angle lens thing you can do. And using shutter speeds and knowing what the angle of view is going to be and how much you're seeing on each side. I did the same thing. How many people have been in the salt mines in Hutch? Taking that tram through there? It's pretty scary how fast that thing goes. You know, I mean, really, it goes about three miles an hour. I had to do a real slow shutter speed and I shot, I shot about six, seven of them to make sure that I had something where this lady wasn't moving around and it did look like you're going down through there. And then last year in Wyoming at our workshop, we're driving through all the, the uh, aspen trees. And sit, I wasn't driving, by the way. I was taking pictures. The other half of our family was driving. And so I told her, speed up a little bit. Get up to 25. We're going down this dirt road. And I shot this. All right, going through this. And again, this is with a 14 millimeter lens. So it's really wide. And uh, it, it, it looks like it could get ready to go into warp speed, you know. And, and launch out into space. So that's another thing you can do with the wide angle lens. You can use it to, to get these spatial motion looks to a, to a still photo. All right, here's another place that comes in handy. This is going into a, a rock cathedral, um, actually in Page, Arizona. Antelope. Antelope. Yes, Antelope Canyon in Page. How many people have been in Antelope Canyon? It's kind of a cool place. Uh, I need to go back because a friend of mine went there. He he signed up for a night trip. Ooh. I said, "What thing do you see in there at night?" He said, oh, "I'll show you." They light paint, and then through the cracks, you can see the Milky Way. Look wow. So, so oh, I got to do that. So that'd be kind of cool. Anyway, this is uh, Page, Arizona, Antelope Canyon, and uh, you know, white in the lens is kind of cool to see all the different curves and how everything goes through there. And, I should have taken, I never took a picture of it. There's logs chained up there about 30 feet above you that where they, when it was flooded. You know, it's hard to imagine 30 feet of water going through there, but there's logs jammed up in the top, but they're that way. It's my friend, uh, Dwayne Graham. He, he was in there with me once. I got this shot of him. Kind of nice to have somebody in there for science perspective. Try to talk him into climbing up, and he wouldn't do it. So, uh, <laughs> The other thing you do is uh, Renaissance perspective, where everything goes to a point. So this road becomes, it just kind of runs off to, to that hill in the background. So the road's real wide, it gets narrower, it gives a lot of depth to your photos with a thing called Renaissance perspective. Wide angle lenses are great for that. Um, this is in the old hardware store at, where? Oh yeah, yeah. I'll say I was in there a bunch of times and I somebody took me there the first time and then I found my way back a couple of times. Really, it was really a cool place. I shot a lot of pictures in there. Somebody said, How'd you get that light right there? Well, there was a little light there, but I used a uh, graduated neutral density filter on each side to actually fade in from the side. So I wanted your eye to go to the middle, keep you from wandering out of the photo. You know, uh, we talk about rule of thirds and all these things you want to do for composition. To me, composition is just me getting you to look at what I want you to look at, right? <laughs> Regardless of where it is on the screen, if I can make you look at it, then I've, I've accomplished what I wanted to do. Another one, this is um, at a ranch in southwestern Kansas. I was, the Nature Conservancy sent me out there to document as many things as I could on that ranch. And this is one of my that they, they kind of like because they use it on the back of their annual report. So here's sunflowers, and I know how many people have photographed sunflowers here. Okay. Wide angle lens, I'm down low shooting up because I like the sky, number one, number two, there were power lines back there. And I don't like power lines. So I got down low and I used those against the sky. Here's the other one where I was up high and the field just went on forever. It's a mile square out in Western Kansas, mile square of sunflowers. And I thought that's really cool. But if you really want to show, you want to show what all this is out here, then you got to put, put away your wide angle, get a telephoto, and just bam, with a big 
small winds will make it wind up the field and the flowers just go forever. Pretty cool. That's with a, a 200 millimeter lens. There's another one. This is near our, my house. Sun was going down and I couldn't get far enough away to get the sun bigger. So I had to shoot right there um, up close. I kind of like having that with the sun right there in the background dropping out. Now here's an, another one. I use a telephoto lens. And there's a reason for this because I, I just, I use a, a telephoto lens wide open because what is that sunflower, right? Well, what are these things behind it? They're out of focus. What do you think they are? Sunflowers, okay? You don't have to speculate. You know what they are because they're in, planted in a row. And that's what they are. They're sunflowers. So why in the world would you want all that out of focus back there? I can't think of a reason, you know. <laughs> but I've sent it to them. They said they haven't decided to use it or not. So that gives them a place to put their, their um, information up. And then I, I do when I did this, this was a little workshop I did weekend weekend workshop in Oregon, and uh, she wanted a picture of herself shooting with that. I forget what those things are called, those filters. But so, yeah, I know, but I'm talking about the, the company that makes that holder yeah. and all that. I don't know what it is. Anyway, I, I got this picture for her, and more I look at it, her hands are bigger than her head. <laughs> you know, so, uh, right. Wide angle lens up close to the hands makes them a lot bigger than the head because I'm yeah. doing that perspective thing again. Oh, uh, this was <laughs> this is in Africa. We're up on this uh, what's called a copy, and we're having lunch up there. And I walked around behind my friend there, and I noticed there's a big elephant pile right there <laughs> behind it. <you> know? <laughs> so I got down low with a big lens, and I just. <laughs> And I just said, hey, Jack. And he turned around and I got that shot. <laughs> so then I, I, I doctored up and, and photoshopped it, put his name there. And then I put a poor little word here aimed at that. <laughs> and I, uh, I sent it to him. He's got it hanging in his office. <laughs> he said, see, Jack does know. You know. <laughs> so this is at. Um, Castle Rock. Castle Rock. Yeah, Castle Rock. I've been there a couple of times. Um, hey, Jeff and I were out there. Jeff, raise your hand. And we, uh, I came, we were walking around the old place taking pictures. And I said, Jeff, go down this right here. There's a little, there's a rattlesnake back there. It's right, right back here. I looked around. Jeff was gone. <laughs> <laughs> when I got, to, when I got, I went back to my car to get a telephoto list because all I had was a wide angle. And I didn't want to take too many. Rattlesnake picture was a wide angle lens. So I went back to my car. It was locked. He was on the roof, right? That's <laughs> exaggerating, but, but he wouldn't go back out. So I went out and got some more pictures of rattlesnakes. Castle Rocks, they, I, and what I usually do with a wide angle lens, I'll find a foreground and go around and look for, move till I find the background I want to go with it. This is in Northern California on the coast. This is a Talisker distillery in, in uh, Scotland. And I, I just love the flower. And I said, oh man, look at that sign back there. That's a perfect combination. So um, it was pretty cool. That's, that's a shot with a super wide angle lens. I was explaining to people that you can stop down your wide angle lens and line it up the field. Let's take pictures of these leaves on the ground that had a lot of dew on them. This is in Wyoming at our workshop. And uh, then somebody said, how do you do a starburst? So wide angle lens, you stop it way down and you got it, it just happens. I guess the fraction coming off the edges of the diaphragm blades, it causes that starburst effect. And here's what it looks like when you do one. I said, hey, you know what? We can combine those two things. So I, I did the next shot, which is a starburst with the leaf down there and all the water drops on it. That kind of, that turned out, I was kind of happy with that. That was an aha moment when you think, of, hey, I could combine the two things and put them in one shot. This is a uh, wheat. This is out in Palouse in southeast Washington. You might have been to Palouse. Pretty nice place. Another one, one of their weeds. I just kind of walk around, just hold the button down, walk through the wheat fields and take pictures. This is wheat out by Marion and down a low area. And it was foggy when I got there. And I went down, there's all kinds of water drops. And I got a whole series of those. But again, the sunburst with that wide angle lens. 
um, Joshua Tree in California. And that's, again, Lighting of Lens, Starburst, and the Shadow. Kind of cool. Out in Arizona, where I live in the winter. And um, the big saguaro cactus with the Starburst and the Shadow. And I kind of got it in the corner so it elongates. That wide angle lens, just that projection distortion. This is also at uh, Joshua Tree at one of the overlooks. I just kind of like the look and the feel of this whole thing. And you can see from right here to the rock all the way to the mountains down there, where it goes down in the valley. And I sit there at sunset and take about 20 shots. Um, this is a back up at the Palouse on one of those hills. And, and I, I had purchased before I got my official Olympus 7 to 14 2 8. I had a still got it, um, a dirt cheap $300 super wide angle lens, manual focus. And I thought, do I really want? Well, I didn't manual focus for 35 years. You think I could do it? You know, I could still do it, which I did. So this is just a get down low, sun up there, stop it down, and shoot. Right up into the sun, and you got these great starbursts again. This is in Wyoming, our workshop. Again, um, these are dad shots, DAD, dime a dozen. You just look straight up, take a shot, you get the starburst up there, and the yellow trees and the blue sky because you're in Wyoming. So. On the Oregon coast, sea anemones, I'm looking basically almost straight down at that one. I'm looking all the way up at the end of this uh, tide pool. That's it, the sea anemones. So you, you were talking earlier, so these are not focused at people. These are all just stopped down at 11. Yeah. Like that. yeah. I've done focus stacking. Uh, ask my wife. I'm basically lazy. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to go through all that hassle. I just stop down. Not lazy, you're fishing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's, that's good. Work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also, she also tells me I'm hard of listening. <laughs> All right, this is on a, a, a place called Cape Blanco Lighthouse. Again, this is a super wide angle lens. If you look straight over there, I'm looking straight across. Right there, I'm looking straight up. Same shot from here to there. Now, that's a wide angle lens. We got up on the top and uh, had a guy there. He had been the, the, the lighthouse keeper for 30 years and retired. And now he was a docent and he did the tours. Every time I tried to get a picture of him, he would turn and look out away from me. He didn't want his picture taken for some reason. So I started asking questions about the Fresnel lenses and how much they weigh and how they install them, how they align them. And he started talking and talking. And I took out my telephoto lens, my, you know, it was a 75. And I put on my super wide or one of the wide angle lenses. And I, he thought I was taking a picture of that. And I got him at it, you know, so he. I just kind of like that now. It's a good combination of having him there with what he's talking about. And three weeks ago, I got a uh, I got an email from a lady who lives in Oregon and wanted to know if she could buy this photo. And I said, Yeah, sure. Everything I got is for sale, except for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, you know, she said, Well, I want to buy it. And I said, Okay, great. What size do you want? Don't know. I, can I just get the file so I can print it myself? I, I can do that. You know, you got some restrictions on it. Who's it? What's this for? So again, his name is Bob Johns, the guy there. He died June 15th, and his wife was a good friend of mine. And I he didn't she didn't have any pictures of him with the lighthouse. I said, I'll just send it to you. All right. Don't worry about my else. Send it you can have it. So she told me today she printed two 16 by 20s, one for her, her friend, and one for her friend's daughter who's in New Zealand. Postage was 50 bucks to mail it, rolled up in a tube. So here's another one. This is in Peru. This is a, um, a walkway. Remember, you tilt it up and it gets smaller at the top. That's a walkway that goes up. Someone goes up 125 feet to the, above the canopy. But it looks like it goes all the way up to Mars or something. <laughs> and if you look at him, my wife's got those four, 14 foot long legs, which again goes that distortion, this projection distortion. This is in uh, White Sands. The sun is going down. I actually took two shots. 
when you get the exposure right for the sun, when you get the light on the down below. When I can ACR, I don't sometimes I don't like the look of ACR, so I just do two shots composite than them and uh in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. This is a place in Texas called uh, Fossil Rim, and they have all this wildlife drive through. And this zebra came over and stuck his chin right on the edge of our vehicle. And I took that shot. But I didn't notice as he's got a buddy behind him right back there. <laughs> I'm not happy behind me, but there's another animal back there too. <laughs> also, room's kind of cool because they got these giraffes that come over here. I took this one many years ago before I started upgrading equipment. I went back with uh, with the, the Olympus stuff I've got now, and it's 714. And uh, this guy was coming over, and we're feeding him. And then he kept trying to stick his head in with us. And I, so I took my camera and stuck it out with seven seven millimeter. And started shooting, and he, he's looking right down at it, like, eh, What do you got there? And then he got that even closer where his, <laughs> his whiskers were almost touching the lens. And I said, That's enough. I pulled it back, and just as I pulled it back, about a 14 inch tongue came out of his mouth. <laughs> Look at my lens, I guess. This is in the Galapagos. I just kind of like the colors and the puffy wilds up there. On it. But I'm shooting that way. I turned this way, 90, 90 degrees. And I've got sea lions on the beach, one of them nursing. Got the same sort of watercolor, not quite as good, but it's just a lot more pleasing to me to have animals on it. Um, this is some driftwood in Oregon, on the Oregon coast. I, don't, I can't figure out what it is. It just doesn't look, it looks like it's malformed or something. But, Pretty cool looking. This is one of the very early ones they do that 28 millimeter lens, Jackson Lake, Mount Moran, and the Tetons. And it's a, original was a Kodachrome slide. They don't, and the Kodachrome is really good, but it's like it's like uh, eight megapixel cameras. So now that I'm shooting 20 plus, my slides don't look all that great, you know, even though I digitized a lot of them, 10,000 during COVID when I couldn't go anywhere. I digitized 10,000 of my slides and um, something on the north of 90,000 went in the landfill. Mm -hmm. Just throw them away. This is up in Jasper National Park in Canada, a place that I really like to go. It's a horseshoe lake. Water is usually pretty calm, get good reflections. Back out at Monument Rocks, and the princess plume was, was out really and strong. And I just, I kind of like the way that one plant kind of mimics the shape of that formation there, and the light was coming from the right direction, it just all worked. Again, out there, Monument Rocks. This is actually, I'm pretty sure this is your photo, Cindy. Okay. okay. My wife's photo, with the things in the foreground and background. Um, she's a really good photographer. She doesn't think so, but she is really good. And then some plants up on top of Coronado Heights with a thunderstorm in the background. I kind of, I don't know, I don't, want, I don't care for that that much, but it's, this is out of Quivera National Wildlife Refuge, and there's a windmill out there at a certain spot. You know where it is. We were out, we were out there that night together, right, Jeff? Yeah. That's the night you the video, and the guy drove right in front of Oh, yeah. We're trying to, I'm shooting time lapse. The guy pulls up and says, Where's Fly Vara? And I'm going, You're right. <laughs> Go, you know, get your car and go. Jeep and go somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, this is a guy that in my person that's from he's we used to be in California now he's in Arizona and he comes in and plays steel drum. And I just took a couple of shots for him for his website. This is rather interesting. I was in Tanzania, I was with these Maasai, and I'm shooting video of them with my little video camera hanging off this shoulder and this shoulder of Canon 5D threes. One's got a 24 to 105, one's got a 16 to 75. And they're, you know, they can't see anything with the video camera. I'm just, it. and I just pulled one of the cameras off and I handed it to one of the Maasai. And I just showed him how to push the button here and how to push the button on the back to review it. And I gave the other one to another Maasai and they ran around taking pictures of each other. This is one of the photos they took. Um, here's another one they took with us. This is another one they took and then this is them looking at the images in the back of the camera and laughing about it. They were, just, they were so intrigued with being able to do this. You know, like turning I mean, you know, they were walking around carrying four thousand dollars of camera gear in their hands. But so uh, it was kind of fun. So I went, came back here, and before I know I was going to go back to the same place again. So I printed 
a hundred and five by sevens, the pictures I took, pictures they took all through their village. I know the protocol, so I gave them to the chief. He passed them out to everybody, so everybody had a picture. They see themselves a lot on the back of digital cameras, but they don't get a picture out of it. So I took them back the next year. They had all these photos of themselves. They thought it was just awesome. And um, those same guys that were in the other pictures came over and wanted to get next to me. What I didn't tell them was I submitted their pictures to Africa Geographic, and they used them. So, <laughs> so they came over and got their pictures taken with me, and they all got short hair. And I asked the chief, what's the deal? They don't look the same as they did last year. He says, when you're Maasai, you turn 17, you're an adult. You clean up your act. <laughs> Until 17, you can do whatever you want. When you turn 17, you're an adult. You clean up your act and, and uh, fly straight. Okay, cool. I don't think he knew what fly meant. High school senior, you know, pictures of him. He, was, he loved golf, so I did this setup shot. I was asked to photograph um, wheat harvest. And just happened to have one of those spectacular nights, and I decided to do it. And I probably shot 300 images that night. It was just spectacular, beautiful. Um, Bryce Canyon in Utah, early morning sunrise. I took this shot. And I had to knock people out of the way that kept bumping up my tripod. <laughs> uh, they didn't speak English. <laughs> and they always had to take selfies, stand up and take a selfie with the thing in the background. You, know, you get out of the way, I'll take your selfie for you. This is a state park in Utah. Goblin, Goblin Valley, Goblin Valley State Park. And if you haven't been there, there's a little sign on the highway at Goblin Valley State Park, 14 miles. You pull off and go to it. It's really it's spectacular. It's cool formations. Mm -hmm. I'm just walking through it. It's amazing. Oh, cool. Goblin Valley, so don't forget that one. This is back out of mining rocks. The keyhole's got sunshine through it. There's some buffalo grass out there getting lit up. I thought this would make a nice combination. So I went for that. Um, the school, the school out at, um, at uh, Tall Grass Prairie. And I wanted to get that shot, but it had the shadow in for the tree. So the tree becomes part of the shot. So I moved over, got the tree, got the shadow, ties it all together. Went back in the winter. I like that shot. So what if the tree could be worked into this one too. So I went over, yeah, there's a tree, a little snow packed into it. And I did that one as well. And then I did this, this one, I actually used the wagon lens not stop down, I had it wide open because I wanted the back behind these flowers out of focus so they would stand out a little better. And of course the, the school's out of focus, but if you're doing a, a series of shots of the same thing, it's um, kind of not, everybody knows what it is. And there's sometimes when you just, something happens, you gotta put down the wide angle and get a, Get 100 millimeter. This is a sunset out there. It's a school. Fox, Lower Fox Creek School. Teeter Rock. How many people have been to Teeter Rock? I mean, it hasn't been to Teeter Rock. It's kind of a cool place. Yeah, I know you have to go there. <laughs> uh, well, I was out there and I thought this is a good, good black and white. So I shot it in color and I converted it to black and white. And I just, it's not about the rock so much as it is the sky. Um, out in Oregon, again, flowers close, cliff on the background. Um, another one with flowers close, and I one little element, this little thing, I call it a stopper. So when you, the first thing you look at when you look at this photo is your eye sees the flower, the flower, and it starts up, oh, can't go out that way. So you can range it back down, so it's called a stopper. Keeps you within the, the frame. And then a trail there, and, and the highest point on the Oregon coast you can drive to. These are poppies in uh, Washington State. And, um, oops, go forward again. That right down there is my shadow of my camera. You got to kind of watch that occasionally. Um, this is Bigger Crater Creator in Arizona. And believe it or not, one of my really intelligent friends said, man, they're lucky it hit where it did because it's real close to the visitor center. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, Calvary Stones. This is on the Outer Hebrides in Scotland. And I was photographing, was photographed in three or four different days different lighting conditions. Family showed up Sunday afternoon, and the kids were in there in the middle, which is kind of, I think, called a burial chamber or something. And they're playing. So I put on my 7 to 14, walked in the middle of them, and shot this shot. One of my favorite shots from Scotland. There's the kids playing in there. Uh, this is also in Scotland, and I just like the color of the flowers against the blue wall, but I used my wide angle because I wanted to pick up the pink. It ties in with this. Just the colors just kind of tie together in that whole thing. 
Uh, this is also in Scotland in the Highlands. Uh, one evening there, sun going down. Bridge next to the B and B we we're staying at, and I went out to this is Badlands National Park, and I, I went out there just before sunset, dusk. It was getting dusk, and I found this formation. I think it's only about ten feet high. And I walked around, and finally found using my phone to see where the Milky Way was going to be. I found the angle I wanted. I put a marker down on the ground, a rock, so I could find it at night with a headlamp. Went back out there that night, set up, and I took this shot. And I light painted that thing. But, you know, you have to, when you're doing this light painting, you don't want real powerful flashlights. It's a light painting with this little thing, which is not much of a light, but, you know, your ISO 3200, 1600, it's going to add up pretty quick. You don't need much of a light. Uh, one of the hiking trails in Arizona we're going, I just kind of like these limbs coming, these roots coming out there into this wash we're hiking in. This is at an arboretum that we go to out there, a really beautiful place. And this one that really distorted tree. And I went into Lightroom and just did a brush, pop some white up there because it looks like it's something mysterious now. This again at that speed, this is on the train first class, no less, going to Machu Picchu. And uh, just slow shutter speed, and you get that whisking along. Almost every one of them, they're blurred, except for this one. So, this is a tall grass prairie and the ranch house. And I took a group out there, and we're all out there shooting. I look over, everybody's got their tripod set up. Good thing. And I said, Where are we? And they said, What? I said, What's the name of this place? It's tall grass prairie. Oh, yeah. And we're photographing the ranch house. I said, Yeah. <coughs> At the tall grass prairie, so yeah. How tall does your grass look? Uh, not very tall. Get your tripods down, boys. Lower your tripod down, shoot to the grass. Now we're at, we're at the tall grass prairie. So you got to think about what you're photographing and, and interpret it right. This is a tall grass prairie because the grass sticks up into the, into the view. Uh, Car Hinge in Nebraska, Starburst, that's sold to a magazine. It was supposed to stop pay homage to the to the gods of the road or something. I don't know. They wrote, they wrote up some kind of junk. I'm not, I didn't write it. Think of this. <laughs> this is a uh, Lake Marie and the Snowy Range. And believe it or not, my toes are just barely out of that shot there. You notice a lot of these are vertical. Because I just think vertical gives you from your feet to the horizon with these real wide lenses. And I like that. And so we're my wife and I are sitting there just about ready to pack up and go. This young couple comes running up and he's yelling at her, get the tripod set up. She's and get the camera, and he's get his camera, get his lens on. And he said, man, this is spectacular, isn't it? I said, it's okay. <laughs> he said, what do you mean, okay? I said, oh, you should have been here 20 minutes ago. So really? He said, yeah, there's 20 minutes ago. I'll show you the back of your camera. I said, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going to have divorce proceedings going on right there. <laughs> Jim Richardson and I were out in South Tallgrass Prairie at night. We were experimenting with, this is in 2016. Oh. We're experimenting with, with long exposure and, and stars and stuff. Up at the ranch, I'll go pretty quick just to get through this. Another one at the workshop on the ranch. I just kind of like the feeling of that when you're bright in the middle and dark on the edges. And then this is down in Peru in the rainforest. I didn't expect to see the, the, the Milky Way there, but I did. And I, I'm going to stand up there and I could hear jaguars crawling all around behind me and stamping sticks and stuff. And that's what my brain was telling me. They weren't there. But I, <laughs> This is an environmental portrait of this crab. He was on the beach by himself. He was patrolling that beach, make sure he didn't draw you know, plastic bottles or anything. <laughs> and I just, I just kind of like that shot. I got some great shots of him close up, but I said, hey, let's show him where he lives with this wide angle lens. Um, this is interesting too. At the ranch, we did night shots and the stars above the cabins, and we did usually the light painting we did that night. But I, I kind of liked what I had, so I, I put a rock down. Right, in three rocks actually with the legs of the tripod. Where I pulled the legs up, brought it back in a cabin, left everything set up, went back out just before sunrise. I set it back up. I took a couple of shots when this when this was lit up, not not sun, but it was just enough light you could see you could see it. And I came back and married the two and, and Photoshop blended them together. So it's a, the best light painting job I ever did. I just waited until the next morning. Um, Yellowstone. Nothing special except they were, these are bison, buffalo. Um, 
the Devil's Tower. I don't, I'm not sure why I put that in. I wanted to put a big, a big uh, flying saucer above it. Oh. <laughs> this is a, a state park in northern, uh, above, uh, in northern Nebraska, up above the fort there. Remember the name of the fort? Fort Robinson. And this is a really cool place. Great trails there to hike. You get things to see. Pigeon Point Lighthouse. California llama at Machu Picchu. He, his nose is about two feet from my lens, my wide angle lens. So. And then you can use it for the grass in the foreground. I'm, I'm hurrying up here a little bit. We got this um, guy at the ranch again. This guy's name is Ace, his horse. And the, the sun was shining through. I didn't really, it didn't look like that. And I said, Can I kick up some dirt? I said, sure. So I just took my boots and stirred up some dust. So then you can see where the light was shining down. And it just looks a whole lot better than just having something you can't tell exactly what it is. Oregon Coast, a place called Neptune Beach at Sunset. Uh, this one you might want to tell a photo lens. That's about a <laughs> nine foot rock python in a canyon in Arusha National Park. It is done with a wide angle lens. And uh, then I handed my, my phone to one of the guides. I said, get this shot. So we went out there and and now with it, you know, pictures of ourselves with this big rock python. I want to use them for Christmas cards. My wife said no. I don't want them. <laughs> anyway, that's um, that's enough. Can I make it? Two minutes to spare. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. And, uh... Questions. Um, those of you in the in the room, as well as uh, on uh, on Zoom and Facebook, you can type your questions as well, and I'll, I'll ask them to, to Jim. Perfect. No questions. I did a great job. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When you flew that special plane in Salina, how long ago was that? And what year was that? Do you know? Mm, it was just before COVID. Oh. Good plane locally around here. What's that? Is that airplane owned locally? No. Okay. Because no. there was a guy up in Ottawa that had one. Yeah, they try that one travels around a couple of different places. In fact, it was in the Evergreen Museum, Evergreen Flight Museum out in Oregon for a while. I had pictures of it out there and then I flew with it. So co-pilot. You want to be when you have a wreck, you want to be close to the front, you know. <laughs> yeah. One of the three engines in good shape. Yeah. Any questions? Any other questions? I mean, yes. Well, so, Jim, I noticed you were, you clearly have a lot of experience with like shooting assignments because you said you shot this, this way, you shot this way. If you always keep that in mind, how you can use the, how you can use uh, a particular subject. So, do you shoot stuff until you get bored? Okay. <laughs> or do you shoot until all right, I got three or four and you're good? Like, That's oh, not really true because I got a Maxwell. <laughs> I've been shooting out there since 93, you know. I've got, I did, I've probably deleted 10,000 bison pictures this year. Well, no, I understand, I, but it, it's more about like, how do you, as you use the light up, how do you make sure you, mind, or you mm -hmm. keep up the creativity with the light up? So I'll just get the same shot over and over. Oh, this, it's a challenge, but you know, I, uh, 2016, I think it was, I, I spent eight months out in the field with Jim Richardson from Geographic. 14. I looked it up. 2014, okay. So we're out there together shooting. And it was at the, when they were, when digital was first really, I mean, Nikon didn't have a full frame body yet because Jim had bought Canon so he could shoot full frame. He had Canon cameras and lenses, even though he had all Nikon stuff. And I worked with him. And when I'd go up, he said, let's shoot together. Okay, we go out. I go, I take 10 shots. I said, Got it. And he said, okay, why don't you hold the reflector for me? So okay. A little twisted here, a little twist there. I'd be there for 45 minutes changing the, the reflector and you know diffusers. And he shot, he probably shot uh, 200 shots at the same time I shot 10, 15. But he said, you know, I gotta give him, I gotta give the editor lots of choices. So, so I kind of I kind of picked up on that and I started doing that too. I started shooting more. You know, I'm just I look at it and say, yeah. And, and, it, and I, you know, I had a program once I did where I showed, like this shot, eh, this one, eh, ooh, mm, great, you know. It's a progression going from satisfactory to great, hopefully great. 
I like it. I, mean, I don't care about you people. Okay. But, but the important thing is make yourself happy because uh, there's not a whole lot of money in this anymore. So just enjoy it. Yeah. And have all your friends say, wow, how'd you get that shot? You know, it's kind of like catching the fish. Where'd you catch that? I said, you wouldn't believe this. You're right in the top lip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's interesting now that the the top end smartphones now have these wide lens settings that you can punch the 0.5 button. And it's what do you any thoughts about about the, these wide angle lenses on the smartphones? Yeah. At our Great Plains Nation photographers meeting, John Richardson is going to spend two and a half, two hours roughly talking about smartphone photos mm -hmm. that he's doing for national. He, he actually was going to lead a trip in, in Scotland and he was heading out the door. The wife said, where's your camera? Here? So I'm just using my phone. She said, Jim, you're a National Geographic photographer. People will be very disappointed. Oh, all right. He goes back, it's camera back. Oh, he did just you, shoots all day with the phone. Did you tell us that, what's the, what's, can you tell us the information for that, the date? November 4th is when the meeting is, if you go on the line to Great Plains National Photographers Facebook page. If you're not a member, ask to join. Tell me you remember the, this camera club or whatever. And I'll let you in, and then you can download the registration form. It's an all-day meeting. We start about we, registration starts at eight. We meeting starts at nine, goes till about four thirty, and um, it's basically one guy, Jim Richardson, talking about shooting in Scotland in the morning and about some of the stuff he's done there and some of the strange wow. situations he's been in the afternoon. He's going to talk about shooting with the phone. Can you, can you download that form off of Jim and send it through? No, I don't have it on there. You can, if you go to my page. Yeah, if you go to my Facebook page, it's on there. Yeah, I don't. Do Facebook. And I'll um, uh, I'll I'll email out the info to our our email list too. So okay, thanks, Andy. Yeah, yeah and if you're if I encourage you all if you're not you on our email have to list, -register. you don't have to pre-register. You pay at the door. Oh, yeah. yeah, and the thing about it is, it's expensive for all day. It's twenty bucks. Okay, <laughs> with a guy from National <laughs> Geographic. So huh? figure that out. Yeah. Anyone yeah. else? It's one hundred eighty, two hundred dollars. Yeah, because it's at the Opera House. So we're three, four, Maxwell. Oh, yeah. What's that? Oh, yeah. Maxwell. Yeah, the, the night before, we're doing a sun, sunset tour at Maxwell. And if you want to do that, you better register for, register, register for pretty quick. On Sunday afternoon, we're doing a fall colors, whatever happened, whatever we find out there at three o'clock in the afternoon. And you can register for that too with fans, of, uh, friends of Maxwell. And there's. You, you know how to get in touch with them and register for those if you want to go to it. And generally, they're pretty good. Richardson's going to shoot with us Friday night for sunset, and then Sunday it's uh, roll the dice, see what you get. <laughs> Somebody said, you, you think we'll see the bison? And you know, you know, it's wildlife, you know. <laughs> I've been I've been snookered several times. <laughs> so there's a wide angle shot at you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Make sure you stand in the middle of the field. Wide angle X point now. Yeah. And this is a got it's all computer adjusted to make this not a total. Well, it looks like it's, it's, like it's got some distortion going on. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just enjoy photography. I mean, just don't do it. And it's fun. Um, somebody that wanted to get into it, and they asked me, what, what do I need to do? Is to get a camera? You know, and then what next? I learn computers really well because it's, it's um it used to you shot slide film you send it off you got it back that's what you had right now you get it back and you got to run it through your computer because the, the processors these cameras are not very good so you run through use the old computers your processor and you and you start mess, messing with it okay that's enough okay yeah. Well, thanks. Um, I'll uh, I'll share share with you all. Um, oh, no, that's right. The magnet stopped working, so you can just the the green button thing is not in effect. You can just exit as normal. You all know about the green button. That's no, that's not a thing anymore. Now you can just escape. You can just leave. There's no there's no green button. Needed. So thank you all so much for coming and uh, yeah, keep in, keep in touch with the club, and I'll uh, let you know about the potluck as well as the programs we've got. We will have a program in October as well, and then some and then that'll be the last one for this year, and then we'll have some more coming up after the holidays. So thank you so much.